You want me to go ahead and share my screen? Um, yes, let me stop the share of this one. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. Rosie is going to get going with our video. Okay. Everyone see that? We're here today on Chris Wilson Wilson's farm, and we're going and uh, she has hair sheep. So we're going to talk a little bit about how she got into this, and then what it actually takes to have the sheep here on the farm. So Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit first about your farm? and how you got into sheep, what you did before that, and everything. Okay, uh, well there's right at 50 acres here. This was at one point belonged across the road to a farm that had been in the same family for seven generations. The last generation did not want to farm. So they sold this side of the farm on this side of the road. So, uh, I was, look, I was in Rock Springs, and we had about 23 acres, I think, which was not enough. I didn't think, my husband thought it was more than enough. But I found this out here, and we decided to move out here. My original intention was cattle, because I grew up with cattle. I grew up on a farm, and we, had, we never had any sheep. We had nothing but cattle and hogs. So uh, I started out with cattle, but I had a problem once with, I was doing AI breeding. So I had a heifer that was ready to breed. The neighbor back here on this back side had a big dairy and had a lot of bulls and not a good fence. So the bull wound up in my field chasing my heifer and I worked for probably two hours to try to get the heifer to the barn away from the bull with no luck whatsoever. But the man that lives back up, which you can't see, back up on the Mitchell Ridge, he worked at the dairy. They had a border call that brought the sheep or the dairy cows in every day to milk. So he saw what was happening. He brought his border collie and I'm telling you, in 30 minutes, I had that heifer in the barn, the bull back across the fence. I come back to the house and told my husband, I said, I gotta have a dog. You know, <laughs> can't do this without a dog. So I got on the internet and started researching dogs and found a litter of puppies from a national champion dog out in uh, Billings, Montana. Called the guy, just so happened he had a litter of puppies, had just been born, so when the puppies were eight weeks old, he put a female in a crate on a plane and he picked her up and knocked. So I had the pup, and then I thought, I gotta find out something about training the dog. So I started going to sheep dog clinics. Well, you gotta have sheep. So that's how I got sheep. Five sheep, started out with five years, which I bought from Bobby Ford over here in Sulphur Springs. And they were really, really cheap because they were hair sheep. Because at that time, nobody had hair sheep. They only had wool sheep. Hair sheep were totally worthless because they didn't have any wool. So I was able to buy them really cheap. Uh, so that's how I got started in sheep. And I just kept uh, working with the dog, kind of adding a few more sheep now and then. In the meantime, I had built up a herd of 20 registered Charlotte cows brood cows, uh, and I got to a point I realized that was about all I could do. You know, 20 was probably my maximum. And I had really good cows, and they were really gentle. They weren't crazy like a lot of Charlotte's were. Uh, and I could handle them easy, but if I was going to grow and make more money, I was going to have to do something else. So I kind of got to a point that the sheep were eating what the cows didn't. And the sheep really weren't costing me anything. And when they had lambs, that was all pretty much total profit. But when I figured what I was feeding those cows, it was kind of hard to make a profit with no more than I could run. So I decided to sell the cows. And I just advertised them and 
one man bought the whole herd, and I will tell you that I cried when they left, <laughs> but I got over it. Because <laughs> then I concentrated on the sheep okay. and just kept building up sheep. So how long, how big is your herd now, and how long did uh, it take you to get... I know you've gone up and back down and right several so. times. Yeah, uh, a lot depends on the weather. You know, that three years of drought, I sold about 250 years because there was no way that I could finish that. Year. I decided that probably my ideal number would be a hundred or less breeding years. Right. So let's talk about what's the infrastructure that you need to have sheep basically on the farm. The kind of fencing that you're using over here and... Well, this is electronetting, which is a, an electric fence, but it is portable and it's easy to move uh, and you can put it in any kind of shape you want if you want to make an S or you can divide fields with it, which you can see I don't have any permanent fencing right through here because I pull this up and I'll let the sheep graze a lot of this down. Now on the other side is permanent fencing. So I've got my fields fenced off and the perimeter. The perimeter fence is the most important. You have to have woven wire perimeter fencing. Uh, not so much to keep your sheep in. Sheep are not that hard to keep in. It's to keep the other things out. You know, because everything wants to <laughs> yeah, so, right, uh, including your neighbor's dogs, right, which will put you out of business overnight on if they can be in. So, so you need the perimeter fencing, you know, a good woven wire fence. And we have run across the top of all of it a high tensile electric wire. And the purpose of that is to be able to move this electro netting and hook to it to electrify this, this net. Okay. So then um, you've got a little feedlot down there. Is that what that's for? No, or? actually that is working equipment okay. that I have pulled out and lined around the outside of it. No, for The only reason is to try to keep the water out of our, we're gonna to have to do some ditching around it. Right. Because all these heavy rains in the last couple of years, I mean, it's been just soggy in there. Right. So right. the thought was pull that all out of our, let them graze in there until we get into the dry season. Then we'll try to do some ditching and draining to make that a little more useful. Okay. So, but that that is a, a cost share so, okay. from the Department of Agriculture. Roosters were a common Yeah, they're very loud. Yeah. Uh, that's my lamb barn. And when I lamb, all of the ewes are back here on the hill, I call it. They all have their lambs up on the hill. Nobody lambs inside of barn. Everybody lambs outside. Then as they lamb, I will pick up those lambs and bring the lambs and the ewes down to my lamb and barn. The ewes will be put in a jug, which is just a pen. Uh, with their lambs and they'll stay in there two, three days, depending if she's got a single or she's got a set of twins or she's got a set of twins. While they're in there, then that gives me a chance to make sure that the ewe does not have mastitis. The lambs are nursing good. They know who their mother is. I can go ahead and tag those lambs and with 
before them in my records. Um, if the ewe needs to be dewormed, that's the perfect time to do it because the rise in parasites is just before they lamb and during lambing. So if you can strategically deworm at that time of the year, then you're, you're not spreading parasite eggs all over your pastures because of those little lambs going out have no resistance to the parasites. So that's a good, that's an ideal time to do that. Then after they come out of the lambing jug, they'll go into usually this field uh, and there will be nobody but using lambs in this field. Uh, and just the ewes that are going to lamb up here. So, so what, if you were planning, <laughs> what time of year do you try to have yours? Well, I like to lamb in the fall. Uh, for one thing, the weather's a little bit kinder. Uh, it does have its drawbacks because if you lamb in the fall, then you've got lambs through the wind and you don't have grass. So you're gonna have to supplement those lambs to get them up to try to hit the Easter market, which is typically the biggest market of the year. But the lamb market in the last few years has kind of trended a little bit different. Uh, the past couple of years, the highest price for lambs has been in January. That's probably because nobody has any. You know, they've all sold them out either at Easter or then in the fall. You know, so you go through, go into January and there's no lambs for the market. And they've gotten really high during January and February. So that, you try to look at the trends of the market, which in the past few years has told you nothing, you know. Try to plan your lambing at that time of the year. The good thing about hair sheep is they're out of season breeders, which means they don't have to breed typically like the wool, a lot of the wool breeds will only breed as the days get shorter and the nights get longer. The hair sheep will, not all, but most of them will breed any time of the year. And so, the breed you have is? Katahdin. Katahdin. Mm -hmm. And are you pleased with that? I, I love them. They're really good mothers. There's no shearing. Uh, they raise good lambs. They are really good at, just like I lamb out on the hill, uh, they'll pile those lambs, make them get up and nurse. If it's cold, you'll see the ewe lay down in front of those lambs and kind of tuck them up under, you know, to keep them warm. Uh, whereas a lot of the wool breeds, they don't do that, you know. Uh, so I really, really like the Catons. And they are just a meat breed. They, the meat has a milder taste than the wool breed, which appeals to a lot of ordinary people that have never eaten lamb. Uh, the Europeans, they, you know, they grew up eating a lot of lamb. Here we didn't, so they don't mind the wool breeds. They don't mind that stronger taste, but typically what I've run into here is if they've never really eaten the Katahdin, uh, their complaint is I had lamb once and I didn't like it, it was strong. Right. Yeah, but the Katahdin is really mild, very, very mild. It takes on whatever you season it with. Uh, whereas beef and pork, no matter what you do to them, they're still going to taste like beef and pork to a certain extent. This, these half sheep, whatever you season them with, that, it takes that flavor on. So it's, it's a little more appealing to most people. So let's talk about markets, because you've, you've marketed several different ways. Right. So from having it going and, you know, having it packaged to just putting them on a, <coughs> on a trailer to go. So talk a little bit about your evolution you know, where you are and where we are here in East Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, when I started out, of course, I didn't have that many lambs, so I didn't have too much of a problem marketing it. I had a friend that was originally from England that lived in Oak Ridge, and I kind of marketed most of my lambs through her because they had friends. There was a lot. Oak Ridge brought in, the National Lab brought in a lot of scientists from outside the country, so a lot of those people loved lambs. And she kind of spread the word, and for a few years, that was about all I had to do with her. Then uh, I was contacted by uh, Heritage Foods out of New York, uh, Patrick Martina, I believe is his name. Mm -hmm. He was real highly involved with the slow food movement. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know how he found me, but he he called me and wanted me to supply lamb. And at that time. I thought he was kind of nuts, you know? <laughs> and 
I sort of put him off. I said, I don't think I got enough. Well, he just kept calling. And he would call back the next year. And then he'd call like three times. So I entered into an agreement with them. And I thought this is going to be kind of worthless. But it turned out to be really great. They, they did all the marketing. They had a, a mail order business. They sent out catalogs. Now I think they just basically do it online. But they would pre-sale a half of a lamb. And their biggest market, of course, was at Easter. So they would take all the orders. They would then contact me with how many orders they had taken. And we'd set up a schedule. I'd schedule it with the And then I would uh, just, they would send me a file with all the addresses in. They would contact FedEx. FedEx would pick those lambs up here. Contacted, I don't know if it was Karen or uh, or who contacted me. Somebody contacted me about selling lamb down there, and I thought, I don't believe people in Jonesboro will eat it. But I decided to give it a try. And I had a lot of inquiries the first market that opened. And I sold a little bit of lamb, but uh, you know, I talked to people. People would stop and ask questions. Well, the next week, I sold a lot of lamb. And I stayed down there for about eight years. Mm -hmm. Through the years, though, I have been in contact with different buyers that bought for processors down south or up north. And, you know, whatever I had left land-wise that year, I could, I'd could i usually give them a call and I could sell some of them that way. So it's kind of developed into a more permanent relationship with selling to some of these buyers. Let's talk about your dogs, yeah. These are oh gosh. And one reason I picked that breed is this coat. You see they have just a really short coat. They don't get all matted up like the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, to worry about grooming these dogs. Uh, they shed once a year, just like the sheep. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of self-cleaning. I don't care how dirty they are. By tomorrow, they're clean because their coat doesn't hold it. Their coat doesn't hold, it. Doesn't hold on to it. Uh, the other reason is they're very aggressive. And you can see he's wearing his battle scars from yesterday's coyote fight, which I'm glad to say they won. So he did not survive. The females over here, she's a little bit thin. Kind of so, but I mean, I, in the past three years, they've probably killed half a dozen coyotes that I picked up. Tell me how many they have kept out of the field. Because all night long, they are patrolling the perimeter. Um, and this uh, is the only breed you've had for a guard dog? No, I've had Maramas, uh, which I really like the Maramas, but they have a little more coat than this guy. So, uh, especially in the summertime, because they tend to sleep with the sheep, and if it's raining, you know, the dogs have the long hair, that hair gets wet and gets matted up. You get some hot spots and things. So this smoother coated dog is just a better choice for me. Now, talk about your border collies today. I know you raised one to help you, but yes. after that, what have you done since then? After that, I have not started with any more puppies because uh, when you buy a puppy, you are at least two years away from a working dog. And you have to have the knowledge to train it. And I'm not saying it can't be done, because a lot of people are doing it. But it is absolutely a full-time job, training that dog. Because when you get a dog, the dog knows more than you do. So you have to learn to. Uh, it's said that it takes five years to finish a dog. But it takes 10 years to make a hammer. So uh, there's, there's a lot of work involved in it. And you have to be willing to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on the average, what would a trained dog be? 5,000 or? 5,000. Depends on their level. 
level of training. Uh, a lot of professional trainers will start dogs at 15 months old. They'll see that that dog is maybe not going to make the trial dog that they want, and they'll sell those at a fairly reasonable price. You know, three to five thousand dollars. And go. Uh, and that's a hay basket. You know, you bring them in, you put their put the lamps in here. I dip their navels in iodine when I bring them in. Uh, these rings are for the water bucket and the feed bucket. The first water that I give these use, I put blue light in it, which is an electrolyte solution. Because when they lamb, they lose a lot of fluids. So they'll get sometimes an imbalance. They'll go off of feed. But generally, if their first water has some electrolytes in it, they don't go off the feed. Uh, the first 24 hours, they don't get any grain. They'll just get hay. Mainly because they've been so full of lambs, they couldn't eat a whole lot. So they come in here, they've emptied those lambs out. they got lots of room to eat. It's better for them to eat some hay than to try to load up on grain. You know, they get uh, an acid stomach, you know, and you've got another problem. So, so they'll get their electrolyte water and plenty of hay, you know, okay. for the first 24 hours, and then they'll get started slowly on grain. So you've got a lot of jugs here. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's not enough when you really start lambing. I have had to build jugs out in this walkway and over here. And then I've got another place up here that I've got jugs. Because I mean. A lot of these use a lot of times they will synchronize their heat together. Mm -hmm. So you won't have one or two lamb one day. You'll have ten or twelve. <laughs> and then you know you, you're busy getting all those in. You don't have time to work these to get them back out. You know. So and you'll get all that. How long do they stay here? If they have no problems, they'll stay here two days, three days maybe. Mm -hmm. If you got a set of triplets, they have to stay longer, of course. Um, you got a lamb that's got a problem it's not really that interested in nursing or it's just a little slow or you know the weather is terrible and you've got a very small lamb that needs a little extra they'll have to stay in so okay. but on average two to three days okay good and uh, this is the creek feeder segment you see these lambs are over here down that's got creep in it uh, which they really would not need that creep this time of the year. But I like to feed them a little bit of creep. It just keeps them, it can keep the protein level up on these lambs. Uh, they, they can carry a parasite load, not have any problems with parasites. So I try to, try to keep them on a little bit of creep. And I'll usually, the creep consists of corn, oats, soybean meal, uh, these uh, 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 devices, uh, 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 This one has got a heater in it because I've got electricity and put a heater in it so it, it doesn't freeze during the winter. But these are sheep waters and they, you can cost share on those from NRCS. Uh, they will help you with those. Did NRCS help you with any of your internal fencing? They did. Okay. If you've just got five or ten, you probably put them in a stall, you can catch them. Yeah. But when you get more than that, you can't catch them. These little suckers are slick. I mean, they're like, it's like trying to catch minners, you know. <laughs> and when you crowd them into a place, it's like they get claustrophobic. So they're, they get kind of crazy. But I use the border collie. I bring, I can bring 300 sheep up that hill. Bring them in here, put them into this holding area run them down this way and do whatever I need to do with them. I've got my scales here so I can weigh my lambs so I know what they weigh. So when I'm getting to the sale, I've got a little run that I'm trying to get because you can't guess their weight. Right. You know? right. uh, I heard somebody 
say they missed the chicken by 100 pounds once. Well, that's about the way it is with sheep. Yeah. I mean, you look at a lamb and you think, gosh, he weighs a lot. But they may not weigh that much. Or you look at one and you think, well, it doesn't weigh anything. But it'll weigh a whole lot more than you think. So okay. scales are important for me. Okay. Because I want to know what I'm selling. And these were cost shared by? They were cost shared by tape. Yeah. Okay. EP. Okay. All of this equipment, well, some of this equipment was not because I had it before the program ever started. Right. But I bring them down this raceway panel. If I'm going to sort the way I sort it, uh, it's to sort right here with this gate. Right. I'll put them over into this side. If I'm sorting off lambs to sell, I'll bring them all down, you know, and they'll go in here, the ones that are to sell. And they go wrong right on out if they're not. So, and I've had to, during lambing, if I'm by myself, which I am most of the time, if I have a ewe that is having problems, say her lamb has got a foot back or a head back and she she's going to have to have help that you can't they won't let you just walk up to them in the field i just bring them in here if i have to bring them out bring them walk them down through here until i get her i'll stop her right here i've got this gate i can just walk in behind her i've delivered several lambs right here mm -hmm. you know so it's it's useful for a whole lot of things mm -hmm. okay um, and your dog brings all of them all yes. the way down here. You don't all have the way to down. Do I don't have to do anything, and she'll stay behind them okay. in that sort lot and keep them pushed up into these into this raceway. Okay. So. Um, so, do sheep need shade in the hot part of the summer or not? You'll see sheep without shade, but yes, they need shade. Okay. Uh, now that doesn't have to be a structure; it can be a group of trees. Okay. But they do need shade. Yeah. So, What's and as far as rams, what do you do about that? Are well, they, the rams have their own field. I mean, are they ones you raised out of your herd, or? Some of them are, and if you have enough ewes, you can kind of do that by separating off a group of ewes to this ram and a group to this ram, and those two rams are not related, so you can get enough outcrossings to where you can raise your own rams. But now I don't keep that many rams, so I, I usually buy a ram, uh, and if I don't keep his ewe lambs, I can use him several years. Mm -hmm. I only buy from somebody that I trust. Uh, I have the lambs or the rams checked by a vet before I ever breed with them. When I bring them in, they're put into this holding area and they're kept for about 30 days to make sure that there's no problems. Um, the rams are kept separate from the ewes until I'm ready to breed, and I only breed one time a year. Uh, the rams will stay in about 30 days because I want to know when I'm going to start and when I'm going to stop. So uh, the ewes will cycle about every 16 days. So that that's not going to catch them all through two cycles, but it'll catch a lot of them through okay. two cycles. And then the uh, last thing then, and then I want to ask you after this question, you know, what would you recommend to somebody starting out? But before that, let's talk about your animal welfare certification. Okay. Uh, I started that, well, let's see, this would have been my 12th year, I think. Uh, and I kind of ran across them. That was, well, 12 years ago. That was back when there was first some talk about animal welfare and the way people were raising things. So I started searching for what was, you know, a certification for the way you raised your sheep. And I came across the animal welfare. Uh, so I read their standards. There was nothing, none of their standards was anything I wasn't doing. So I thought, well, this, this sounds pretty good. Because I, I called them and talked to them and then I filled out an application and they came and they did a farm visit and an inspection and they tell you exactly what what you have to have you need your records and all your feed labels and all the things that you need for them to certify so i had all of that and i was approved and i stayed with them for 10 a little over 10 years mm -hmm. but when i stopped direct marketing everything i could have stayed and just not told the truth but I didn't feel like that was really ethical. Because they're not, because 
you have to stop because you're not there when that lambs are killed. Right. They have to be killed at an approved plant. Okay. Which was in this case Snaps Ferry for Washington County Beef. Well, if I sell these live lambs, I do not know where they are being killed. Right. So for that reason, I, you know, I talked to them about it, and we they tried really hard to find another way for me to keep my certification because I've been with them so long. And they knew that when an auditor came here, I didn't have any problems. Mm -hmm. I was doing what what they wanted, you know, which was a big selling point for me when I was rec marketing. Because a lot of people, they may not care where it comes from, but they want to know where it, how it was raised, how it was processed. You know, low stress handling, low stress processing. You know, they're really interested in that. So that was a really good selling point. But when I started selling live animals, they really don't care, you know. Um, so anyway, I gave up my certification. But they did leave it open to where if I want to come back, then all I have to do is let them know and they will send an auditor. I won't have to go through the whole process again. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they've been really great people to work with. And what is it called? It's called, uh, it's called Animal Welfare Approved, but now they have kind of, they were, uh, there was one big umbrella mm -hmm. group and they have kind of went out now and they're called a greener world. Okay. Because they're, I'm not sure exactly why they've changed their name. Okay. But they did. Okay. But it's still Animal Welfare Approved. And you can search Animal Welfare Approved and it'll pull them up as a greener world. Okay. So to end up, let's talk about if you were just starting out, what would you recommend people do first? and not do. Okay. <laughs> you can do the not do first not or? Do. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I mean, let's assume that you have a piece of land uh, and you have it fenced. Because if you don't have some perimeter fencing, you're just wasting your time, you know. I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna keep them in four strands of electric warm. Well, you might do that for a little while, but it's not gonna last long. So, you know, I would say, even if you're just fencing off an acre, mm -hmm. you know, fence that mm -hmm. and then continue with the rest of it. And don't start out too big. Everybody wants lots of sheep. I started out with five. Mm -hmm. I've been up to 500 ewes. I have never bought another ewe. Every ewe that I have was born here. Mm -hmm. uh, start out small. Five ewes is good. Because sheep, you either love them or you hate them. There's no in between. And you're gonna find out real quick if you're one of the lovers or the haters. Mm -hmm. So if you're a hater and you just got five, they're not too hard to get rid of. But if you're a hater and you got 50, you got a problem. Okay. You know, so start out small and grow. Because if you start out with five mature ewes and you breed them, the next year, if they all have twins, there you've got 10 lambs. You've went from five to 15 in five months, mm -hmm. you know. So they're kind of like rabbits. If you don't knock them in the head, they're just gonna keep breeding mm -hmm. and producing, you know. So I would say start small and learn as you go. Don't get overwhelmed uh, because you can easily get overwhelmed, mm -hmm. you know, with not knowing what to do, especially if you didn't grow up with them. You know, sheep are not like other animals. You know, they're different. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear people say sheep are stupid, sheep are not stupid. Sheep are really smart, really smart. But you have to be smarter than them and you have to know how they think to handle them because they don't handle like other animals, like okay. cattle. Okay. Anything, any mistake you made at the first that you would tell people don't do or because you started small, you were able to learn mostly? I, I was able to learn. Uh, I have made the mistake and I still do it to this day, of naming things. <laughs> because if you name it, it can't leave. So I have got a field over here that I call the assisted living field. <laughs> and there's about 20 old ewes in there that will die here because for one reason or another, they had a name and they can't leave, you know, so. That might be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, thank you so much. Um, when we show this, we're going to close this out now, and then you're going to be available for questions from the class uh, on Thursday night. But thank you so much for opening your farm and letting us come. You're welcome. Thank you.
right. Okay, so Chris, if you want to unmute yourself so that um, you can, that people can hear you. Um, and Lexi, right. you unmuted all the participants. Um, yeah, sorry, real quick, I will go through. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we'll just let people speak up and ask questions. We've got about uh, 22, 16 people online. Uh, do any of you have any questions to ask Chris here in real life? What kind of a profit margin do you make? Well, that's hard to say. A lot depends on what you what you have to buy. I mean, if you have to buy all your feed and all your hay, uh, of course, that's going to cut your profits down. But uh, typically, you can figure you're going to make after your feed bills and so forth, maybe. $50 on each lamb in profit. Now you'll sell those lambs, you usually figure you're gonna get $100 per lamb. But uh, depending on what you have to put into them, you know, it may be closer to $50 that you're gonna show for a profit. And Chris, is that on the hoof? That's not one that's been processed. No, that's on the hoof. Okay. Other questions? Well, What's the growing season? How long does it take from start to finish? To get a finished lamb? Yes. Uh, a lot depends on the time of the year and your feeding program. But usually I can finish a lamb, and that too depends on your market. If you're going to sell on the hoof to the livestock market, you want a lamb that's under 80 pounds which is gonna take you maybe three months, maybe four months. If you're gonna, to, to direct market, process that lamb, it needs to weigh over 100 pounds. So that again depends on your feeding program. Uh, usually, when I was direct marketing my lambs, I processed at like 125 pounds and it usually took me four to six months to mm. get a lamb big enough to process. Mm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What's the agency in Tennessee that helps you pay for the um, fencing and whatnot? Uh, NRCS, Natural Resource and Conservation. Thank you. And NRCS is a federal agency. They are found in your USDA office in most counties. Um, here in Jonesboro, ours are together with farm services agencies and rural development. And um, in order to get started with them, you need to have a farm number and, uh, uh, and then they will go through what are the options because there's various programs that pay for various things. Anthony is going to cover the, the state programs, our, our county agent here, Anthony Shelton, in just a minute. But the federal programs are all in uh, USD building. And they will not pay for your boundary fencing. They can only pay for internal, but they could also pay for your watering troughs um, and um, other conservation items that you might need on the farm. Thank other you. So okay, other questions? Well, I had a question for Chris. Um, you talked a little bit about seeing market trends. Um, where do you find out that information? Is that widely available for folks to see? Uh, most of it is through different organizations. USDA has a website, but of course, during all this pandemic, those sites have been down. But they have a weekly market report that you can watch. And then the ASI, the American Sheep Industry, they always have market reports Ooh. and different trends. And Anthony, do you want to respond to that also? You'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, if you uh, find the right place on USDA, you can still find those. It, it's a little difficult. I know Maryland tries to update that on their sheepandgoat.com website as well. Um, yeah, there's there's some, that's probably the best place. Of course, we always go by New Holland, Pennsylvania for a lot of folks around here. But again, don't get hung up on selection one. Uh, it's pretty tough to get a selection one in this area, not 
not trying to offend anyone. It's just um, Chris would probably uh, uh, concur on that. It's it's um, just just look at those reports and pay attention. Some of them are by a hundred weight, and some of them are per head. Uh, so there, there's a big difference between hundred weight and, and per head. And yes, Dana, at the end when I do my presentation, I will touch on NRCS projects just a little bit. Okay. Other questions for Chris? Chris, I was wondering on the feed that you feed, is it a pre-mixed bag or do you mix it yourself? Uh, it's a pre-mixed bag. I, I buy it out here at M&M &M, uh, Farm Supply and Fall Branch. It's a formula that I came up with, gosh, I don't know, maybe 15, 16 years ago. And they started making it for me and then just kind of adopted it into their program. And that's what they sell now for sheep feed. Oh, that's good. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Um, it looks on the Q and A. It says, "Would you recommend to start with five ewes and a ram?" Which I think in the video I did. But. Well, I think five ewes is a good number. It takes five sheep to flock together properly, and the reason those train the dog because you want those those sheep to flock together to train the dog. But five is just a good number, uh, and then of course, if you're going to breed them, you've got to have a ram. So Chris, you did sell some of your beef packaged, um, which is, is difficult, especially for small cuts. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and the, the difficulty of working with a processor? Oh gosh, that's, it's easy to raise the sheep. It's easy to get them processed. It's hard to deal with the processor. If you're going to direct market, that is going to be your biggest hang up and your biggest hold up is the processing. Uh, we don't have real butchers here. We have people that were self-taught and they have one ideal and I had another. But that was by far the biggest, the biggest thing about direct marketing cuts. And these were USDA, these would have USDA stamp yeah. on? They have to be USDA inspected you have to have a license uh, it's called a farm based meat permit you have to be inspected every year you have to have a freezer that has nothing but that in it, it has to have a lock on it uh, you have to have uh, let's see you have to have your name on the label the label has to be approved by usda which the usda inspector at the processor normally can't approve that label. It's got to have your contact information on it. And uh, of course it has to have the cut, the weight, all of that has to be on that label. And when you sold at the farmer's market, you had a enclosed trailer that you carried your freezer in and then a generator, right? That you sold out of at the farmer's market. That's correct. You have to have some way to keep that cold uh, Jonesboro does not have outlets for you to plug up, so I had to have a generator that I carried in the back of my truck to plug my freezer into. And you, so, you have to have a place to park that. Uh, when you get back, you have to have a place to park it to keep that freezer plugged up. And, and at, at this point in your life, you're selling everything on the hoof. That's correct. Uh, it just, it took too much time. Uh, since I'm by myself, it, it was just too hard to keep doing that without help. And this is someone that's an aggregator that aggregates a, a group and takes them somewhere? Say that again. It's, a, it's someone who collects a lot of lambs and or sheep and takes them to Atlanta? Is that where yours are going? Well, I'm not sure exactly where they go. There, there's some of them I think go to Atlanta. Some maybe go to South Carolina. Uh, and some may even go to New Holland for all I know. But this is just a buyer that, uh, that buys for probably a group of processors. And do you take them to him or does he pick them up or how does that work? Well, you, uh, 
there's several different ways. They usually pick them up here for me. And then we will go to Kingsport to the livestock market to use their scales. So we weigh them all. And then I'm paid right then on the weight. Okay. All right. And how, how many times a year do you do that? Uh, it depends on the size of the lambs and the number I've got. Last year, I think I had three different groups that I sold. Okay. This year, it'll just be the one group uh, because I don't have that many lambs right now. And so you have 50 acre farm. So how many, your most you said was 500, but what's the good carrying weight for your land? Uh, usually if I'll stay between 100 and 125 years, I'll do pretty good. A lot depends on the weather, which we never know what the season's going to be. You know, right now we were having tons and tons of rain and we did last year too, but then we got really dry in the fall. So, you know, it's, uh, you just have to kind of work at figuring out what's, what's the right for you. And it seems to be a hundred or so for me. Okay. Other questions? We've got time for about one more question and then we'll go on with our next speaker. Any other questions from the group? Well, Chris, thank you so much for uh, letting us come walk around your farm and joining us here tonight. And um, what we're going to go to is our next speaker, who is Jesse Shanks, who is with UT Extension and I believe based at UT. So Jesse, do you want to talk a little bit about you and your position? And then you're going to be talking about getting started with small ruminants. Jesse? Yes, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, yes. perfect. I see some head nods. Um, so like she said, my name is Jessie Shanks. I'm actually the new small ruminant specialist there at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I'm housed in the Brim Animal Science Building there on campus. And I also have, um, not only am I the small ruminant specialist, but I also have an appointment with youth programming. So you'll see me doing, you know, some of that stuff. And I'll talk more about that later. But um, Tonight, I wanted to talk with you about getting started with small ruminants, and I think at the end, we'll have time for a few questions as well, uh, hopefully. So, a little background about me. I grew up in Lenore City, Tennessee, which is actually right below the Knoxville campus, and I have been at UT my entire career, and I raised South Down Sheep with my husband and four-year-old daughter. We have about 35 head of mature ewes right now. And as most of you know, as sheep producers, that's not the only thing you have. You've got yearlings and ewe lambs you're keeping and whatnot. So I usually just tell people I have 35 mature ewes. So that way they don't know the true extent of how many sheep we have. Um, but I'll go ahead and share my screen here with you if I'm able to do that. Yes. All right. Can everybody see the PowerPoint here pretty much? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Okay. So they asked me to talk about getting started with small ruminants, and I have a lot of information here and recognize that most of this information could actually um, uh, be taught in two hour chunks. Like you could do two hours on nutrition, two hours on reproduction. But what I've done here tonight, I have condensed all of this into just a few slides on each topic. So uh, write down questions as you have them, and I'll be happy to answer those at the end. So in terms of what you want to do with small ruminants, you really need to sit down and think about what your goals are. You know, how many do you want to have? Do you want sheep or goats? How much land do you have? Do you have um, you know, any zoning restrictions where you currently live that are going to <coughs> excuse me, prevent you from you know, building a barn one day if you need it? Those types of things. You also need to decide not only if you want sheep or goats, I'm not saying you can't have both, there's just management considerations you need to think about, but you need to decide what type of production you want to do. Most people do meat production, like we were hearing about earlier. Um, some people do strictly wool production, 
And then there are some dairy operations uh, in Tennessee. There's sheep dairies and goat dairies. So really, you need to sit down and think about that and kind of decide um, what it is you want to do. So briefly for some of you, and I apologize if this is review, I wasn't sure what everybody's background was, but sheep can be classified into two different types. You've got wool sheep and you've got hair sheep. So wool sheep typically will produce um, wool and meat. Most of them are dual purpose. Some breeds that we'll talk about actually are better only at wool production. Like merino sheep, yes, you could slaughter them and get some meat, but their main job is to produce a very high quality fleece. You want to select which type is best for you. And I recommend you talk to other producers, see what they have, check out the breed association websites. Those are open and, and ready to answer your questions, be it Katahdin, Dorper, you know, Hampshire, whatever. You can check out those breed association websites and learn quite a bit from there. Also, talk with your county agent. Anthony's on here and he's going to talk to you a little bit later about some stuff, but talk with him about, you know, what does good in your area. Have you, you know, has he come across any other breeds that really do well? So be sure to, to touch on those people. Also, be mindful of that breed's problems and needs. So if you've got boar goats, for example, they're going to be a little bit different than if you had Nubian goats. Um, a lot of people think you can just lump everything together and, you know, it's fine. But there are some considerations you need to think about before you actually jump into that. Now, hair sheep, actually, they're typically only going to produce meat. Um, their hair is not really used for a whole lot, but they don't need to be sheared. So what they're going to do, they're just going to shed every year. Um, I know some people that shear some of, the, some of their hair sheep just to get all of their coat off. They don't shed, they don't drop all of their hair at once, obviously, it, it comes off slowly. But um, hair sheep are gaining in popularity. A lot of people like the carcass from a hair sheep. And depending on what breeds you get, they're very hardy and prolific. Um, and again, they don't need to be sheared, which for some people that have wool sheep, that can be one of your um, larger expenses. You're not gonna break the bank getting your flock sheared, but it is kind of one of those things you need to consider. So just some common sheep breeds. I'm not going to talk about all of these individually, but I've got a list here for you of meat breeds. Um, and, and I've got wool breeds over here. I apologize for that typo over there on the right. But um, the, the ones that are most common are Southdown and Hampshire, Suffolk, Cheviot, and then you've got Columbia's, Dorset's, and Monadale's. Uh, this is not an extensive list either. I just put, you know, some of the ones that are more common around here. And then over there, you've got a few more um, finishing out with the Katahdin and Dorper. Those are both hair sheep. And then your wool breeds are going to be more responsible, like we said earlier, for producing a high quality fleece. Goat types and breeds, like I said earlier, you've got meat goats and then you've got dairy goats as well. There are also fiber producing goats. So um, some of you may not be as familiar with some of those breeds, but they do exist. So some meat breeds, boar goats, obviously you're all going to recognize them probably when you see them, but you've also got Kikos, Spanish, Anglo-Nubian, and Feigning goats. Um, all of those are, are fairly high quality meat breeds. There's several dairy breeds. Um, I've seen all of these in dairy operations uh, just, you know, throughout the country, not necessarily here in Tennessee, but then you've got fiber breeds as well, Angora goats, and then cashmere. No matter what animal you choose, you've really got to think about, you know, what type of land you have, what it's best suited for, the facilities that you have or that you want to get set up, and then appropriate fencing. So, You've always got to have, you know, that big perimeter fence that keeps everything on your farm. That's your goal. You don't want anything to get out in the road and become a liability for you. You don't want them getting in your neighbor's flower beds, you know, things like that. So things to remember here. And again, I have a whole different lecture on fencing um, that I use for my sheep and goat class. But in a nutshell, 
goats are escape artists. They love to climb. They love to um, just get out. They'll go through hot wire even. I've seen them do that. I've seen, I had some goats once. They would climb five foot gates just because they wanted to. They'll squeeze into small spaces as well. So really you're gonna look at woven wire or hot electric fencing and there, there's various types of that. But something you need to keep in mind, goats prefer browse. They, they'll graze grass, but they really like taller weeds, shrubs, trees, those types of things. And they will damage trees. If you have too many goats in one area, they will go after the bark and they climb on them. So they can be very damaging to that. Some people use goats. You've probably seen them on Facebook and in the news. They'll use goats to clear areas of kudzu or, you know, fence rows that need to be cleaned out. They're great for that, but just be mindful if you've got too many in there, they, they'll eat everything. Um, so be, be aware of that. In general, sheep are easier to contain. I'll say that. I have a few ewes that um, routinely just roll through my high tensile wire that is extremely hot. I don't know why they do it. They just got sheared about two weeks ago though. So they have stopped that since then because it, it hits them a little harder. Both species, sheep and goats, need to be protected from predators as well. So that's another reason you need that good perimeter fence, um, you know, to keep things out that don't need to be in there. Think of dogs and, you know, we could do a whole nother lecture on predation. Dogs, neighborhood dogs, wild dogs, coyotes, those types of things. Uh, facilities not necessarily required. You do not have to have a 40 by 60, you know, open sided barn or closed up barn. Um, but if you do have a barn, you know, an area that's covered, has good ventilation, those types of things, it can make your life easier. Um, even if you just had a shed with some working facilities in there and a gathering pen to get those animals up, that could be a whole lot easier than, you know, just keeping your animals out in the field. At one point or another, you are going to need to get them into um, a trailer to take them somewhere. You're going to need to get them all together to do vaccinations, deworming, that type of thing. So pick something that works for you and your animals and be mindful. Um, what works for goats might not necessarily work for sheep, depending on the setup you have. Just a few tips for facilities. What you want them to do um, for your flock or herd, you want it to be safe. You don't want there to be hazards that, you know, they can get hurt on or anything like that. You want it to meet their nutritional and behavioral needs. Um, you want to give them plenty of space. We'll talk about space requirements here in a little bit. And you want to be able to manage disease. So if you were to have an outbreak of something, um, you want to be able to manage it, quarantine those that need to be quarantined and those types of things. And you also want to reduce lamb and kid mortality. So um, lambing and kidding facilities need to be a little bit different, but that's their goal. For you, as the person that's managing these animals, you want it to be safe for you. You want it to be easy. You don't want to have to um, put up 15 panels and you know assemble this, that, and the other and then have those things fall down while you're working your, you know, 80 head of sheep through. You want it to be easy for you. You also want it to be efficiently organized. Um, I don't know about all of you on here, but I, I find things in our barn that I'd like to change. Um, and sometimes we do change them, but you, you find out what works best by working in there. And then you say, well, this could be better, or, you know, I could change this. Um, I could put a gate here and make things a lot easier. You want it to provide you with good time management. Um, you don't want, you know, an area that you've got to go search for lambs in. You want to be able to see them all at once in a pen. Um, you don't want it to have escape routes for them or anything else like that. You want it to provide good communication. You, you don't want to have to go through three different rooms back you know, like let's say modified horse stalls to tell somebody, hey, I need you to come up here. You wanna be able to look down the lane uh, where you've got your sheep or goats lined up in your sweet tub and, and talk to somebody. So you want to provide good communication. It also needs to provide the opportunity for you to do animal ID and record keeping. So that's, that's a big one. 
Um, sheep and goat producers are pretty good at that most of the time, but we could all be better at it. These are just some examples of housing. Um, you know, it, it really depends. The one on the bottom right is a, um, it's a tourist attraction. So the goats are up on top of this building. I, I don't recommend building that per se. That's more there for a laugh. But you can, you know, modify almost anything to work for small ruminants. I see a lot of horse stalls renovated into stalls for small ruminants. You just want to make sure it meets their space requirements, good ventilation, um, th things of that nature. This is an example of a hoop barn. This is a friend of mine up in Indiana. He's got about 900 mature ewes, um, and he uses these hoop barns as um, basically a big mixing pen for ewes and lambs. Uh, before they actually wean them. So this is an example too. Housing requirements, and you can typically find these online, um, but if you're looking at the different options here, you can see you've got a dirt lot. These are square feet that each animal needs. So you've got a bred ewe needs 20 square feet in a dirt lot. If she's confined um, with a dirt floor, she needs 12 to 16 square feet. If she's got lambs with her, she needs even more space. So um, you can use this to kind of look at the size of the barn that you might want to build. And, you know, like we, like they mentioned earlier, you don't want to start off with 50 sheep or 50 goats. Um, we'll get into reproduction here in a minute, but they multiply very quickly. Uh, you will, you will double your numbers in one year. So be mindful of that. You, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew to begin with. Just a few tidbits here, uh, differences about goats and sheep. Goats will typically seek shelter from rain, snow, and hot sun, whereas sheep don't really mind being out in the rain. They'll be out there grazing, obviously not if it's a thunderstorm or something, but they'll be out there, um, you know, grazing away if they've got some light rain. Goats don't really like that, so they're going to need some form of shelter. Um, goats in, in general, I couldn't find specific numbers in a table like I have for sheep, but basically they require about 15 square feet per animal when they're in confinement. And then it's also recommended along with that confinement to provide an outdoor run of sorts that has about 25 square feet per animal um, that you could turn them out in and, you know, give them a, a chance to exercise. Your stocking rate, this is for sheep or goats, um, this depends on the forage availability of your land. Um, you know, how much forage is it gonna produce? What are you gonna supplement? Those types of things. Typically, and this, is, this one's for goats, six to eight goats per acre is a rule of thumb. Now, if you've got lush green pastures, you could probably handle more than that. If you've got nothing but woods for them and you're gonna feed them hay, you're probably going to want to give them a little more space or have less goats there. Like I mentioned earlier, if you've got too many goats in an area where you're trying to get them to clear it, they will damage trees. So you've got to be careful about that. Now we'll step into reproduction. So again, I, I could talk for hours on just this topic alone, but anatomy, real quick, everything kind of starts from the inside and goes out. So we'll start with the ovary. That's where the eggs get produced, that the female ovulates every you know, 15 to 18 days, 16 on average. You've got the oviduct there. That's the, the area where fertilization occurs. Move down into the uterus or the uterine horns. That's where the lambs and kids actually develop. Cervix, um, that's the gateway to the uterus, keeps everything nice and, and closed. Uh, make sure you don't get urine backflow and those types of things in there. And then the vagina, obviously, and then externally, you've got the vulva. This is a picture of a reproductive tract, and this animal is actually laying on its back. Um, and if you're looking towards it like we are here, the head is going to be at your feet, and you're looking back towards the rear end. So that's to give you an idea um, you know, what this animal <clears throat> is in, it's, it's obviously dead, but this gives you an idea what that repro tract looks like. Same in a goat, very similar. The past one was a sheep, this one's a goat. Everything is right there. The bladder is closely associated with the repro tract 
and um, they've got the exact same parts. Now the male, um, all of you can see that they have testicles and a penis, but they also have accessory sex glands. So these actually, they add the substrate or the liquid that the sperm get transported in. Um, the female's vagina is not a friendly place if you're a sperm cell. So the accessory sex glands actually add um, nutrition, buffering capability, they do a lot of things but they add the volume to the ejaculate to actually make sure the sperm have something to travel in, essentially, and it keeps them protected and um, nourished. You've also got the epididymis, it's down there at the bottom of the testicle. If you ever have a um, breeding soundness exam done on your male, the vet will probably palpate those to make sure there's no infection or um, any swelling or heat, hardness, anything like that. And then obviously that's where the sperm are produced. They get produced in the testicle. They go out through the epididymis, up um, through kind of past the accessory sex glands via the vas deferens, and then, um, and then eventually into the urethra. Um, and then the penis is actually the delivery system. This is a picture of a ram's penis. And I always show this to people because um, anyone ever heard of urinary calculi? I'm sure some of you have. So typically adult rams don't have much trouble with that. But if you've got weathers that are castrated, you've removed that source of testosterone, their urethra is going to be a bit smaller. It's not going to be um, as big as a mature ram. So what happens here, if you've got a different calcium phosphorus ratio in your feed, um, they actually can get small stones that end up in that um, urethral process, which is at the very end. The function of that is to spray semen around the cervix to optimize the chance that sperm actually gets into her cervix and she gets pregnant. Um, but when it gets plugged up with stones, you can have a necrotic penis and um, death of a ram very quickly. So I always like to show people that just so you have an appreciation of that. Just a few facts about repro. Um, sheep and goats are seasonally polyesterous breeders. That means they have multiple estrus cycles in one breeding season, typically. There are breeds that will breed out of season. Dorsets are known for breeding out of season. Um, my Southdowns, they typically, and unless I did some extra manipulation with um, you know, cedars and whatnot, they're not gonna come into heat until August or September. Even then, I've got some that are they always get pregnant towards the end of September, beginning of October. So they, they're very seasonal. Um, there are some breeds that will breed out of season. So the closer to the equator, the origin of that breed is, the more likely they will be to breed out of season because their, you know, their origins, um, where they originated from, seasons didn't really make that big of a deal. More facts. Your, um, Young reach puberty around seven to 12 months. It depends on if it's a male or a female. Um, but if you've got lambs that were born back in the fall and you still have them together, they probably need to be separated so you don't end up with pregnant ewe lambs. Their estrus cycle um, can be anywhere from 15 to 18 days. 16 to 17 is a good average um, gestation. Now, this is breed dependent and it really depends on if you've got triplets twins or a big single. But um, in general, we use about 148 days as our, um, our standard there. They are actually in estrus or in heat for 30 to 36 hours. That time period is when they're actually receptive to the male and the U will seek out the male. They basically go and stand next to them. The U is not like a heifer. I'm sure some of you have cattle or have been around them. Um, a heifer in heat is a force to be reckoned with, especially if you're at a show or something like that. But sheep, they're just kind of like, eh, whatever. I'm going to go stand next to the ram. That's all they do. You might see a little bit of discharge, but other than that, they're, they're pretty silent about their heat. <clears throat> and for most of you, um, most of you probably know twins and triplets are normal. And depending on certain breeds, triplets and quads are normal. 
So just keep that in mind. That's that goes back to um, your flock or your herd will multiply very quickly. So just be careful with the number you start out with. Real quick here, lambing and kidding. Um, you get your animals, you've got a ram, he successfully completes the breeding season in the fall. You start to have lambs and kids there in January, February. Um, depending on what part of the country you're in, you may not start lambing until April. It really depends on what your season is and what your market is. But um, basically, these are two really good pictures here that I use in my sheep and goat class. But basically, when you see a head coming out or membranes or you know a swollen vulva, a large engorged udder, that means that female is getting ready to lamb or kid, depending on what species it is. The one on the left, uh, the sheep, she's actually pushing. You can see she's got her head up, she's grunting. The goat over here on the right is kind of pawing the ground. You can see her foot. She's probably preparing to lay down and do the same thing. Obviously, when you've got membranes present, you can see a nose, you can see feet, um, you've got a lamb coming out or a kid. You might see some blood, you might just see membranes. It really just depends. And I promise you, after doing this for I don't know how many years, you kind of figure out when they're going to lamb. Um, I do have some mature ewes, for example. I can look at them, they'll eat their feed at six o'clock. I'll go back down to the barn at 11 p.m. and they'll be laying there with twins. So they can be a little bit more secretive. Um, but in general, you're going to know when they're actually getting ready to go through parturition. Now, this is important here. There are three stages of parturition. So a lot of people think it just happens, the baby's out, and boom, it's done. But the first stage is kind of silent. You're not really going to see this part. This is where the female is going to go through contractions. She's probably going to stop eating. I have some ewes that eat right after they get done lambing. I have some that eat prior to that. Um, this stage is the uterus and the cervix and the ewes body working to prepare her for labor. That cervix is dilating, the uterus is contracting, pushing that lamb's head um, and feet up against the cervix to get it to open up. This lasts for about two to 12 hours, depending on the U. <clears throat> Stage two is rupture of the fetal membranes. You get rupture there. Um, the fetus comes out in about 15 minutes. Sometimes it's a little longer. This can last for several hours. Now, I am not a veterinarian, but if you actually, this is just my rule of thumb that I use, if you have a ewe or a doe that is in labor for more than about, and I mean active labor, they're pushing, you can see something, maybe you can't see anything, but if they're laying down and really grunting and, you know, working hard, I give them no more than 30 minutes. That's my time limit. Sometimes it's less. And then I will put on a glove, always wear gloves. I'll put on a glove and go in and check out, you know, what's going on. I was telling my students um, just a few months ago when we were actually in class, um, I have never regretted intervening too soon. I have always regretted not intervening in uh, the birth of a lamb soon enough. So if that gives you some, some options there, um, I've never regretted going in too soon. Now, some people say you can go in too soon but I have enough experience. I'll watch them for about 30 minutes and I, I typically know when something's wrong. So um, that's my little piece of advice to you. Um, stage three is passage of the placenta. That placenta has to come out in one shape or another. It may come out in pieces. It may come out in you know one big nice um, sheet, if you will, but it's those membranes. This should occur within a few hours, but I have seen some sheep that um, haven't passed it in about 12 hours, if it takes them that long and you've still got, you know, strings of that membrane hanging out, you might want to talk to your veterinarian and try to get some intervention there. Um, typically, they'll give you oxytocin or lutelas or both, and that will help her go ahead and shed um, that placenta. It has to come out. I had a U several years ago. She retained her placenta uh, she delivered, I delivered for her two large dead lambs. Um, she just never went into labor really. And her placenta never came out. I didn't pay much attention to it after that. 
we went to AI her the next year and the vet said, there's something in here. Are you sure she's not pregnant? And I said, no, absolutely not. Um, and it was where that placenta had basically mummified and it formed a ball about that big in her uterus. She would never get pregnant again. So got to get that out. Do not reach in and try to pull that out. Never try to pull those membranes out. Just let it hang and let gravity hopefully uh, do its job. So in terms of basic health care, and again, we could go on and on about this, but sheep and goats are prone to several health problems. They can be limited with good management and attention to detail. I, a lot of people tell me, especially now that I'm in this position, they'll say, you know, oh, sheep are just born looking for a place to die. Well, that may be true if you don't check them every day, if you just kind of leave them to their own devices. Cattle are a little bit different. They're more hardy. Um, you can leave them out on 20 acres and, you know, go check them a few times a week. Sheep necessarily aren't like that, and it depends on the breed you have, but um, it's recommended that you check them every day and, and try to look for odd behaviors. This will help you catch those health problems early. Overeating or enterotoxemia, that is um, basically a buildup of toxins in their gut associated with clostridium perfringens. This is the number one cause of death in market channels. So if they haven't had their CDT shot, they're probably going to suffer from this at one point or another. Um, internal parasites, we all know that's our number one overall health issue. And then you've also got external parasites like lice um, and things like that. And then also pink eye and sore mouth. These are just a few of their health problems. And I picked out some of the more common ones. Enterotoxemia or overeating disease is very dangerous because typically what you're going to see first is death, just sudden death. You're not really going to catch them at a point where this can actually be saved. Um, so you've got to vaccinate for it, have to vaccinate for it. Um, the story here is clostridia are present in the gut at all times. They're there, just like we have bacteria on our skins, on our skin and in our guts. Um, it's there. So what happens when motility stops, everything just, you know, stops and they're allowed to build numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. And then that's when they cause overproduction and then they get that toxin that they produce. This uh, cessation of motility can be caused by milk replacers. So if you've ever had a bottle lamb or kid and they're hungry little boogers. They'll eat three bottles if you let them. Um, but if you've got somebody else feeding them for you, like I have before, and they said, well, he wanted three bottles. Well, those are usually the culprits that are going to suffer from this if you haven't given them um, their vaccine yet. They can um, bloat on grass and you can get a, um, a stop in motility there. They can also do this with overfeeding grain. It happens a lot in young lambs that haven't had their vaccination yet, and they actually are on creep feed. They're allowed to eat as much as they want. They eat too much. They don't know when to stop, and then they get overeating disease. Pink eye, you probably are familiar with this. It can be infectious or non-infectious organisms. Some non-infectious sources of pink eye, and this is basically eye irritation, Bright sunlight can cause this, dusty hay, um, wind, and the combination there with dust. And then you've also got viruses and bacteria, uh, cara conjunctivitis that can also cause pink eye. Early signs are going to be runny, red, swollen eyes. Um, if you leave this untreated and you don't alleviate the cause of the non-infectious pink eye or you don't take care of the infectious pink eye, you could have death in severe cases. That's really severe, but it can happen. Sore mouth. This is one of the most common skin diseases affecting sheep and goats. And beware, this is zoonotic. You can get it as a human. Um, and typically when you get it, the sore mouth isn't your problem. It's the secondary infection that likes to build up um, on the sore mouth. Because what it is, and you'll see some pictures here in a minute, it is actually just an open wound that's kind of sitting there oozing and, you know, all the time. So it opens your skin up to bacteria. 
It's also known as contagious eczema, scabby mouth, and my personal favorite name, pustular dermatitis. Um, and ORF, you can call it that too. That's, um, I typically hear people refer to it as ORF when humans get it. The course of the disease is one to four weeks. You get pustules that appear typically on the lamb's mouth, just kind of here in the corner of their mouth or around their lips. Um, scabs will appear after those pustules rupture and then they will fall off and then the tissues heal. The, the interesting thing about sore mouth, the scabs are infective. So if you have animals in your barn that have sore mouth, maybe they're new, um, whatever, they can pass this to the rest of your flock very easily. It is highly contagious. These um, pictures that I'm gonna show you and the information is from the Maryland Extension Program. So you can see the picture on the left is of an ear. It doesn't look like much of an ear, but those are the sore mouth pustules. They have not ruptured yet completely, um, but they are scabby. Those scabs will fall off. The tissue will heal, um, but no matter what you do to this, I have seen people put um, <clears throat> iodine, bleach, any number of medications on here. It's going to run its course no matter what. Now, if I had an animal like the one on the right, um, I would take some Chlorhex diluted and kind of clean around their mouth to hopefully prevent infection. I know that Chlorhex is not gonna treat the sore mouth, but I'm trying to prevent secondary infection from getting in on top of that sore mouth that's already there. Other health problems um, that they can become infected with, Caseus lymphadenitis. This is typically seen in sheep. It's basically lymph node abscesses. Um, it's recommended that you cull animals that have this. Um, get rid of them because they're gonna pass it to the rest of your flock. Mastitis, just like most lactating species, they are susceptible to infection of the mammary gland. Tetanus, obviously. Um, tetanus you can cover with that CDT shot that we talked about earlier. That, if you use CDNT, that's for Clostridia C and D and Clostridia tetani. So you, um, you cover them for that too. Vibriosis and chlamydiosis are both causes of abortion, uh, not the only causes of abortion, but you wanna be very careful there. That's why I recommended earlier, you have to wear gloves when you're pulling lambs. Um, if you're pregnant and you're around pregnant, um, around pregnant sheep, don't even try to pull lambs. Um, that's one of the first things when I have my daughter, the vets I work with, they told me, do not pull any lambs. There's too many things you can get from those sheep and they can cause abortion in humans. So always wear gloves. I promise you, you don't want chlamydia and you don't want campylobacter that you can actually catch from your ewes by helping them um, have a lamb. So always wear gloves. Uh, there's other causes of abortion, listeria, toxoplasmosis, leptospirosis, and brucellosis. Foot rot, I miss, uh, missed up here. That's another pretty big health problem. Um, you can prevent it with good management, but sometimes it just, uh, these two bacteria that are listed there, Fusobacterium necroforum and Dicolobacter nidosis, they work together to actually eat the bottom of the hook. So, Foot scald is not that big of an issue, but when you get both of these bacteria together, they actually rot the hoof. Um, and if any of you have ever smelled thrush in horses, this smells identical to that. And it also creates like a black discharge from that necrotic tissue. So beware, you don't want to have that on your farm. And, and some breeds uh, are more resistant to this. Some breeds, they're terrible for it. So do your research. Some clues to health problems. Obviously, if uh, a sheep or a goat is off by themselves, something's wrong. Something is very wrong. Um, you wanna make sure that you go and check that animal. They are extremely gregarious. They love to be around each other. So if they're off in a corner by themselves or off in the field, make sure you check on them. If they're not eating, my sheep are hungry little dragons every day. And if I have one that's not eating, especially my lambs right now, I know something's wrong. If they're lagging behind, lethargic, they act anxious, um, or they're vocalizing a lot. These are all things that require 
um, your attention, your immediate attention. <clears throat> now, real quick, we'll end up here with nutrition. So remember, goats are a browse species. They really like to eat weeds. They like to eat trees. You can see the goats on the bottom right. They are going to town in some tall weeds that sheep would probably be like, nope, I'm not getting in there. Goats don't care. They love that stuff. Um, forage is the basis of sheep and goat production. That's what you, that's your goal. You might have to supplement at strategic times, such as lambing, um, breeding, uh, you know, things like that during lactation. You might have to supplement there. In terms of maintenance feeding, and you've probably heard that term before, this is a period of time where we don't want any change in body weight. We don't want them to lose or gain. Um, and then to do this, good quality forage is usually adequate. But if you're in such a condition, say a drought, or you're in a, a, a time when you've got heavy snow or you know no pasture or something like that, you might have to supplement them um, with grain or hay or something like that. At all times, any of these classes of sheep or goats need um, access to mineral and they need access to water. Now, it's important to note here, goats have a requirement for copper. They have a requirement for it. It's not huge like cattle, but they do have a requirement for it. Sheep also have a requirement for copper, but it is teeny tiny, minuscule. Sheep will die if you feed them copper. They will die within a few days. It is a, it's not a good way to go. I've had some do that before. I have five die in one weekend. Um, it's not hard to diagnose. You'll, you need to do a necropsy and get your vet out there to confirm it, but it's very dangerous. So don't let your sheep eat horse feed, cattle feed, goat feed, anything like that. Now, hair sheep seem to be more tolerant to copper, but, um, I'm not going to suggest you go get beef cattle mineral and feed it to them. I would feed a sheep specific mineral. So be careful about that. In terms of nutrition for your new kids or lambs, obviously they're all going to need colostrum. That's the first milk that the female produces. They should get up and start nursing within about an hour. If you had a hard pull, um, took a while to deliver that animal, maybe there were twins and this set of legs was trying to come out and then you had a head from another lamb, whatever the case may be, you may have to tube them with some warm colostrum. In the beginning, you're gonna give them at least two to four ounces. I won't get, get into the specifics of this, but they need about 10% of their total body weight in colostrum within the first 12 to 24 hours. The sooner the better. What happens here is their GI tract starts to be more selective of what molecules it lets in and gets absorbed. So in colostrum, you've got large antibodies and immunoglobulins. So the intestine becomes more selective and basically it shuts off. Um, if you feed a three day old lamb colostrum, they will eat it, that they'll be fine with that. It will do them no good you're too late at that point. You should have fed them colostrum earlier. It's probably just gonna give them some diarrhea or really thick manure, depending on you know how much they got. A weanling, depending on when you wean and what breed you have, you can wean lambs as early as 45 to 60 days. You can wean them up to three to four months of age. You know, Just use your best judgment. Look at the body condition of your females, see how you know much they're getting pulled down they'll kind of start weaning the animal. They're young on their own. They'll start to produce less milk. They're gonna be eating more creep feed or more forage if they're out on forage. Um, but they need good quality forage, lambs and kids do, or and or a 16 to 18% crude protein supplement. This could be creep feed, um, something that is very palatable for them and they're gonna eat a lot of. For replacement females, you can usually maintain them on forage and supplement, 12 to 14% crude protein. They need to be on a positive plane of nutrition, but you don't want them to be obese or fat. Um, you can breed them depending on the breed at approximately 60 to 80 pounds or eight to 10 months. It really depends on what breed you have. A breeding female, again, she's gonna maintain herself mostly on forage. 
Um, again, you're gonna uh, supplement during strategic times and you will typically flush your females with lush pasture and concentrates and or concentrates, something like whole corn, uh, you know, a, a grain mixture for sheep at about one pound, half a pound to one pound per day. And flushing does not mean you're going to flush their system out. It means you're going to feed them more. You're gonna increase their feed, put them on a positive plane of nutrition, and then you're actually going to see a higher ovulation rate. Now, you won't know that. You're gonna see that when the lambs and kids actually come out, but it can get you more lambs. Um, basically, their body says, ooh, I've got good nutrition, times are good, and their ovaries start to ovulate more eggs. So that's what the flushing effect gets you. Three to four weeks pre-breeding and three to four weeks post-breeding are typically when you're going to, um, to give them some supplement. And then, of course, the last six weeks of pregnancy, they need about one to two pounds per day. This is a period of time when you've got a lot of fetal growth. Um, but you don't want it to get too fat, but you also don't want to pull the U down so much uh, that she's not gonna lactate good for you. Lactating female, this is important, especially if it's a first time um, lammer or a, a goat that's never kitted before. You wanna make sure you're supplementing her during this time, <clears throat> um, because if you don't, she could drop body condition score on you, and this could be with good quality forage if you have that but you wanna make sure and don't let her body condition um, get too low. At this point, if they're lactating, you're in those spring months, you're gonna creep up on breeding season pretty quick. You know, right now, people should be thinking about, it's May, people should be thinking about getting their ewes in breeding condition and making sure your rams aren't too fat from, you know, staying in a pen by themselves for several months. That brings me to our breeding male, mostly forage, um, 60 to 90 days prior to breeding, if he's not in good breeding shape, you want him to go into the breeding season with some body condition because he's going to run around for a while and breed females. He's not going to be coming up to the bunk necessarily and focus on feed. So you want to make sure he has some body fat to lose, but you don't want him to be um, in a very low body condition score because he'll just keep going downhill from there. Some resources, and Anthony's gonna talk more about these, I believe, next. Um, our Master Small Ruminant Producer Program is a great resource for you. We are actually working on doing an online uh, Master Small Ruminant Producer. We, in the past, we have liked to have all of you in person. Um, I just did a, a class with Anthony, and maybe some of you were in there. Um, uh, you know, it seems like forever ago, but it was probably one of the last big meetings I was able to go to uh, simply because of the virus situation. But um, we are working on an online program. Um, the topics that we're going to have, you've got nutrition, reproduction, lambing and kidding, and, and there's a lot more. Um, but having this uh, is typically going to qualify you for 50% cost share with the TAEP program, the Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program. Um, you have to actually attend the class, get your certificate, and you're gonna turn that in with your TAEP stuff. But these programs are county-based, so talk to your extension agent if you're interested in getting certified um, and you know make sure they know of your interest. And they typically help teach these. I help teach them um, and several other agents across the state as well. So. It's a great program. Any questions from anybody? And I've, I've got my contact information up here, um, but if you, if you do have questions that you, know, you want answered, first contact your local county extension agent. They are an invaluable resource. And if they have something that they can't answer, they can get a hold of me and then they can say, hey, Jesse, this person emailed me about X, Y, Z. Do you mind to come out and look, or do you mind to help us with this answer? But try to make contact with your county extension agent first, and then they can contact me if it's something um, you know that they're not used to or haven't seen before. So there's my contact information, um, and of course I'll answer questions on here if we have time. So Jesse, why don't we let Anthony go, and then if you can stay on a little bit, we can ask both of you questions at the same time. Okay, that's fine. 
Okay. So Anthony, you'll need to unmute yourself. And Anthony's going to talk a little bit about uh, other support programs. And Anthony, tell them a little bit about where you are stationed for extension. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I am the uh, Washington County Agriculture Agent as well as the County Director in Washington County. So each of uh, the 95 counties in the state of Tennessee has an ag agent and all that good stuff. So it will depend on what county you're in and all that good stuff. You should be able to reach out to whatever county you're in and, and they can help you. And I, I'm really glad to see Jesse on board and all that. It's good to have a small room of specialists. We had one a few years ago that was with TSU, but it's good to have one at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And Jesse's hit the ground running. We uh, have a work group and a leadership team that we do a lot of educational preparation for the folks in the state of Tennessee. So don't feel like sheep and goats are uh, unforgot or forgotten or and all that good stuff. But so in Washington County, um, we do a lot of different programs, but I'm going to kind of can cover uh, UT Extension, uh, a little bit on Tennessee Department of Agriculture, and a little bit on NRCS as well. Um, you know, it's it's going to be kind of short, sweet, to the point, but uh, certainly if you have any questions. Uh, Jesse, can you see my presentation all right? I can, yes. You may want to hit, yeah, play on it. Uh, but I'll see it there, yep. All right, so basically, um, you know, educational resources and Jesse, that may not exactly be the new extension website. We've have have a few of our websites and all that, but I want to let everyone see that we do have a small ruminant uh, website that you can go to and we're gonna be adding things as we go. Um, I, I hate to not uh, I suggest the sheepandgoat.com. It's very simple, but it is ran by Maryland's uh, extension program, the small ruminant. Susan Shonen, yeah. Susan uh, is a very good resource. Uh, she puts a lot of educational material on her website uh, for nutrition repro, marketing, all kinds of good stuff. And the great thing about that website is it's extension led, research led. So most of that information that you're going to see is something that we've done some research extension work uh, throughout the um, 50 states, uh, most of it southeast, uh, northeast, those kind of things. But we do have some publications, uh, whether it be on forages, a um, few on small ruminants. Uh, again, you can go on sheep and goats and find a world of publications with extension. That's what we do. We're an education business. So we're all about educational resources. So if you call my office and say, hey, I hear you give out free money, I'm going to say, yeah, I help with the educational side of it, but I can tell you the agencies that actually handle those programs. Um, I will have to do a little bit of a shout out with social media. I know Jesse's been doing some social media contacts and doing some little blurbs on social media and we do have a small ruminant uh, webpage, uh, UT Small Ruminant, I believe it. Is that the, the word for the it Facebook? Is, it is Small Ruminant Programs at the University of Tennessee. So it's a, so it's a long name, but if you Google small ruminant programs um, at the University of Tennessee, it should pop up there or search for it on Facebook. Right. So that's an option. Um, Jesse had mentioned about the Master Small Ruminant Program. Um, myself and Bob Monsier years ago did a bunch of those. He was in Hawkins County before he passed away. Uh, so it's been a few years since I've done it, but we did one back in March. We did a two day deal, uh, had a lot of uh, great uh, folks in that meeting. Uh, we're going to try to do some type of conference setting on hopefully a yearly basis in the early springtime, like that March time frame, if we can all get back to have meetings and all that good stuff. Uh, but that's a, that's a good program. Uh, regardless if you need the cost share with the Ag Enhancement Program or not, that's a good educational opportunity. We try to bring in a number of uh, speakers and, and it's really good information. Uh, who would I be if I wouldn't be an extension and talk about soil sample and forage, forage testing? to kind of know what your soils are, uh, what your forages are, especially if you're putting up square hay or round bales. Um, our soil sampling fee is $15 at the lab. Forage testing, I think is around $20. It's, it's around 17 to 20. We put a little bit on shipping and all that stuff, but uh, you can get your hay tested uh, to kind of know what quality, especially if you've got different groups of animals you want to feed, kind of like nutrition type. It's a good resource that we can send off to the lab in Nashville. And yes, 
they are still doing those sampling and all that. Um, we are we have soil sample boxes galore and, and forms in the front of our office in a box outside. So um, and we can get you the information for forage testing if you'd like to test your hay as you're making that as well. Uh, this is one thing that I always tell folks about is the manage program. Manage program is uh, something that's unique for UT. We uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Adam Hopkins that can sit there and um, talk with you and, and pencil out numbers basically and see what can be in the green, red. If you've got a diversified operation and you're wanting to do a, a number of things, he can kind of sit down and say, okay, uh, these operations are possibly making money, these are not. Here's some things that you need to think about. So I always try to give Adam Hopkins uh, information on these programs because I think he's a valuable asset and that program in general is a valuable asset. The University of Tennessee Center for Profitable Agriculture uh, has some unique programs when it comes to uh, diversification, agritourism, uh, just uh, selling meat, meat cuts. They do some programs on that, and mostly on beef, but you can take some of it with uh, your small ruminants and, and go forth on that. So hopefully we're gonna work with those folks in the future to continue some small ruminant maybe. But the um, UT Center for Profitable Agriculture is a great program. Uh, utilize that, you can find that. They have a website as well, CPA. Uh, also, an extension, who would I be if I didn't talk about our youth programs? Our youth programs are, are a valuable asset to us. It's, it's our future, it's our industry. Uh, so we uh, do a great amount of local clubs, um, honor clubs, talking about um, doing all their um, little publications, just it, our 4-H clubs are great, but you know, if we talk about our animal science side of it, most folks think about showing and judging and all those things. And I know Jesse's been a heavily a part of some of the showing and judging. If we get to do any of that this year, everything's been canceled through July for our face-to-face -face programs and extension. But uh, we'll get back to that. And uh, these kids learn valuable responsibilities, some life skills that they will always take forth with them. So that's kind of what extension does for the most part. Tennessee Department of Agriculture, as, as Jesse had talked earlier, the Ag Enhancement Program has placed a lot of facilities, a lot of equipment on a lot of farms in the state of Tennessee over the past 10, 15 years. Um, everyone thinks that it's a beef program, and that's not true. There are small ruminants set aside. Uh, most of the programs are 30 head, um, I'm sorry, 50 head for small ruminants, 30 head for cattle. There is a few programs that's more than 50 head, but again, uh, I would say if you've got 15 to 20 ewes, uh, as Jesse said, uh, you're gonna have 50 scattered around there pretty easily. So, um, and that's within a calendar year. So don't get too caught up on numbers. They don't go out there and count all year long to see that, but it's a great resource. I put a web, web link there for you to uh, kind of go back and see some of those things. But they talk about livestock genetics. There's a buck and ram program as well as an AI program that you can look at, look at through the livestock genetics. Uh, there's a livestock equipment program talking about gates and panels and, and all kinds of scale systems. Um, Feeders. Trimming, trimming shoes, what, Jesse? Go ahead. Feeders, like fence Feeders, oh yeah, all kinds of hay feeders. Uh, there's about 30 some items on that livestock equipment deal there. So it's a great, great resource. I know many folks that signs up for that one every year. I think the max that you can get paid back on that is 2,500. Uh, I would say that most of these programs or all these programs here, the sign up period is October 1st through the 15th. Uh, so basically we don't usually find out until about August what programs are gonna be available, how much money, all that stuff. They had a tremendous amount of money that was signed up for this year. They had to go beg for some more money, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I know that they had requested some additional, and I think they didn't necessarily approve that, but they went back to the original $21 million that has been approved statewide. So, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty good deal for a lot of folks. Livestock Solutions, what we're talking about there is large uh, facilities to store feed and those kind of things you have to be pretty big numbers to do some of that livestock solutions. Working facility structures, uh, if Chris was still on here, she, she's done the uh, genetics, she's done a lot on the equipment, she's got one of the working facility structure covered, covering her uh, chute and, and scales and alleyway and all that kind of stuff, so that they pay a program. And, and I would say before I say any more of this, 
you usually have to do it on a what's your best, uh, what's number one priority, number two, and typically they only pay for your first priority. So um, as long as you fill out your paperwork right and all that stuff, they'll pay a preview for your first priority. What Jesse was talking about is if you don't go through the Master Small Remnant Program, you're eligible for 35%. But by going through the Master Small Remnant Program, it allows you to be eligible for 50%. And that's typically good for three to four years on your Master Small Remnant um, Program there. So it kind of depends on when you take it and all that, how long it's good for. Uh, hay equipment, for years they did hay barns and they went to hay equipment this year. So I think they'll bring some hay barns back. I just don't know when. And I always try to include the diversification program because some of some folks want to do some agritourism, petting zoos, uh, want to sell uh, specialty products, whether it be meat, soap, all that stuff. Those can actually be classified diversification program. The thing about that one is you have to have three years of production uh, have to have a pretty extensive report that you write up and all that, but that one is uh, competitive. It, it's kind of like a grant program, but it is competitive uh, amongst each programs within that. But it's the same time frame, October 1st through 15th, and that's done by the Department of Agriculture. You can sign up for the livestock program as well as the diversification program. A lot of folks think you can only sign up for one or the other, but you can actually do both on that. But on the livestock program side of it, you have to pick which is your highest priority, genetics or equipment or work facility structure and those things. Some other things the Department of Agriculture does that a lot of folks don't know, they are the regulatory means of this state. Uh, so you know, a lot of folks try to figure out who's regulating uh, agriculture and they're the entity that regulates agriculture. And I say that because meat sales, we love, and, and this right now with this coronavirus and all that deal, uh, a lot of folks are wanting to sell meat if they can get them processed. Processors are so uh, booked up, it's hard to even do that. But um, they can kind of regulate the meat sales, as Chris was talking about earlier. Domestic kitchen sales, if you're starting to talk about cheeses and all those kind of things, you've got to be careful in domestic kitchen sales. And then of livestock movement. If you're out of state, uh, especially registered animals and all of those, you may need health papers. Uh, I know sheep, when we send sheep to or, or goats even to New Holland, we require those folks to have scrapey uh, tags for them, and you can get that through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. I, I, I would mention, we were talking about marketing early, and they, they may have mentioned that. For years, I've helped um, send loads to New Holland, Pennsylvania with the Hawkins County agents. Uh, we do that about seven times a year. We ship about 100 to 150 goats and sheep uh, seven times a year up there. They sell them up there. You pay uh, nobody the day that you ship them, it all comes out of your uh, sales slip uh, and they mail you your check. So uh, that's an opportunity to sell your livestock as well in this area. Um, and as Dana well knows, uh, she's very familiar with the NRCS program, Natural Resources and Conservation Service. Uh, one of their biggest issues and, and things they're trying to work on is water quality management. They do not build ponds anymore. A lot of folks have asked about ponds. They try to fence out uh, livestock out of ponds, out of creeks. Uh, they will place wells on your property. They'll try to figure out if you, you if you don't have well capabilities, then they'll try to figure out the city water and all that kind of stuff to make your water quality management more uh, appeasing for your land. Uh, manure management. So if you have some problems with manure placement and all that, they can sure do crop not, nutrient management reports and all that kind of stuff. Cross fencing for rotational grazing. They're big on rotational grazing, which they should. Grass is the cheapest feed that you can feed your small ruminants or livestock in general. Uh, big thing there is they do not pay for boundary fences. That's the biggest question we get. Who pays for my fences? Well, the perimeter fence, the outer edges of your farm uh, is out of your pocket, but what they can do is pay for those rotational. When you start splitting up your paddocks, that's when they can start paying and putting water facilities and all that to make you uh, a better system to allow you to move your animals to save your grazing height where you'll have more forage. So, and, and Chris Wilson has done an extremely great job of being able to move her animals around uh, and utilize her grass areas to the best ability. Reseeding and reclaiming areas. So if you sign up for some of these programs, they do it all on point systems. 
Um, if some of the ground has been in crops before or some other problem areas, they can help you reseed and pay for part of that seeding and fertilizing and all that. So always check in on that. And then they do some on feed pad areas and feeding areas because I don't know if everyone else has noticed, but the past two winters may not have been the coldest of winters, but they sure have been some of the muddiest of winters. And I don't care what type of livestock, it's no fun to start uh, uh, mucking around in the mud in the winter so they can help with some of those things too. And RCS is a great program, great. Uh, they do signups typically at the end of the first of the year. So, um, but I would say start the conversation now. They're always signing folks up. It's just when the monies are available, when they start doing those applications, they'll put your name in the pot and all that stuff. Uh, really great program for our area so nrcs uh offices there's uh, i know in washington county we have one in jonesboro that covers uh washington and unicoi county so uh there's there's multitudes of nrcs offices in this state great folks to work with uh, i can't uh, say enough about our folks with greg quillen and i work with some other ones as well in the area but um, some really great programs. Tennessee Department of Agriculture, they have some area folks that work with you. I work a lot with John Hodges, so some great folks that understand agriculture. And with that, Dana, I'll just kind of leave it up. I know my time is just about out. Thank you, Anthony. And um, we did have a couple questions um, that were answered. Um, Let's see. So we already talked about starting with the five U's and Rams. That was answered. And then Jesse, do you want to answer that second question or read it out loud and answer it? Uh, it disappeared now, but let me see if I can find it. I think it was. It said that asked, if you haven't kept goats, this person said, I haven't kept goats in 20 years, but back then CAE was a big problem. Is it still a problem? Um, I answered her. I said, no, it's not as big as it once was, but yes, it can be a problem. It's um, caprine arthritis, essentially. That's okay. uh, contagious, essentially. So yeah, it can be a problem. Okay. And then Anthony, there was uh, one that Jesse did answer, but is there an acreage requirement for tape? Um, but, uh, and she answered, there is a livestock requirement. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, no, there's not a land requirement. The only one that would qualify if you didn't have livestock on the hay equipment and hay storage, uh, you can be doing so many uh, acres of hay. You have to do, I think, 100 acres of hay uh, to qualify for the hay equipment program. But uh, everything else is typically on the livestock scale, unless you're on grain storage and uh, have to be a pretty big grain farmer to do that program. But uh, one thing I would say is uh, always check if you've got 15 acres or more. Uh, make sure that your land is signed up for green belt. Uh, it takes uh, $1,500 in, in three years of gross income to qualify, but that greatly reduces your taxes on your land. So if you have 15 acres and they've relaxed some of those things, so it doesn't always have to be attached. I mean, it can be across the road now. If you got four acres on across the road and 11, I think they're trying to make that work now. So always check into those things. Okay. Um Lexi, do you have everybody unmuted if they wanted to ask a question to to Jesse or Anthony? Um, yeah, they should be able to unmute themselves if they have a question. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, for our two presenters? Well, th these were great pr uh, presentations, guys, and I really do appreciate you taking uh, the time to do uh, join us this evening and let everybody know you know what's going on in the world of sheep and small ruminants and I have attended the the master sheep program and highly recommend it and think it's a great option um, for us for you to go and and it does give you that 50% cost share and Anthony you might want to say it's not 50 is there a set there's a set amount you can't just get 50% of whatever you spend yeah, typically they set a maximum, so you can't, can't go past the maximum. So, for example, livestock equipment is 2,500. Uh, genetics is typically 2,000, depending on what area you're at. So, yeah, it's so if you get 50% on livestock equipment, you spend more than $5,000. The rest beyond 5,000 uh, is on your own uh, on that percentage, but uh, they'll pay up to 2,500. Now, if you only spend 3,000, you're only going to get 1,500. 
And I will say for NRCS programs, if you have less than uh, 10 years of farming and you are filing a Schedule F, um, you can also be uh, allowed to have a higher amount of cost sharing. So if you're definitely within that 10 years and you are filing a Schedule F, then um, you should look into the programs during that period of time because you do get a higher rate of cost sharing. And, it, and again, it's, it's a cost list. They have for everything. So fencing has a certain amount, a rate per foot of fencing and things like that, depending on the type of it. But again, if you are less than uh, a beginning farmer, less than 10 years, you want to check into that. Um, Dana, Dana, that brought up a good point. Um, I know a lot of folks on here may, may just be starting out. Tennessee Department of Revenue, you can do tax exemption if you're a farmer. Uh, there are certain uh, areas that you have to qualify, either show a $1,000 gross income on the past year Schedule F or type a letter up and say, hey, I'm starting up and all that stuff. You can actually find that form on um, our local website, washington.tennessee.edu, our extension. But it's a simple one-page form, but it allows you to buy products, supplies for your farm, feed and all that stuff without paying taxes on it. Uh, I would highly encourage everyone to utilize that. So in, in ending, and uh, we do have classes. They are always the second and uh, fourth Thursday of a month. Our next class will be talking about sustainable vegetables and food safety. We will be continuing to do these uh, video tour uh, with a farmer, and then we will have somebody uh, that is an expert. Um, and so our next class will be at the same time on 528 and we'll be going to a possum bottom farm, um, which is a really interesting farm to see if you wanna look at uh, sustainable vegetables. And then we have Adam Watson also from Washington County, who's gonna talk about food safety. Um, we then go to food production and hemp. Uh, we'll be visiting Dwayne Johnson at Gibson Berry Farm. Rotational grazing, we will visit Mike McElroy's farm. Um, who was a past NRCS agent um, and has been doing this a long time. We'll have high tunnels and irrigation, which will actually be at my farm, uh, Grand Oak Farm. And we have an extension specialist from UT, Brian Lieb, who will be there, as well as Greg Quillen, who is the Washington County Center. We'll then uh, hopefully maybe be able to go to Vera Ann Myers, but we're not sure. Uh, we'll be talking about agritourism, which is Myers Pumpkin Patch and Greenhouses. And then we go to bee, Beekeeping Basics um, with our Tennessee Apiary Inspector Jay and, uh, and Sally Causey, who is at Rural Resources over in Greene County. Um, our last class will be Soil Health and No-Till. Uh, we'll be visiting Rain Crow Farm, which is a urban farm with Rachel Slaughter and Dylan Disk. Uh, and we'll also be talking about uh, being an advocate for our culture and we'll have uh, soil health being talked about also. And then if we have a chance, we will have a party at my farm in September, but we will just have to wait and see if we're allowed to party, I guess, by September. So uh, these are the classes that we have. Uh, you will get messages if you've been attending this one. Uh, Lexi, do you have anything else you wanna end with before we go out. Um, yeah, I will send out. I should have everyone's emails um, from, from the registration, so I'll send out um, all the PowerPoints information. Um, we'll upload this to our new um, uh, YouTube channel for the field school, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll send everyone e uh, information, contact info for our speakers, all that good stuff. So you'll have um, everything for the workshop. Okay, again, Jesse and Anthony, thank you so much for your time this evening. And uh, we'll thank Chris also again. So we will see you in on the 28th. Thank I just you. have one issue. I know, is there a fee for the class? I thought it was a fee. And how do we go about paying it? Um, for uh, Thanks for that um, question. Um, these these uh, webinars are gonna be free. Normally when we do have the in-person workshops, we do charge 15 bucks a workshop and that covers printing and, and dinner. Um, but, but since these are just weird times and we just are trying to get this information out to as many people as we can, um, these webinars will be free. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. And um, 
I'll get more registrations up for the other, I've got all the May uh, registrations up, but I'm gonna get registrations up for the June and July workshops too, so folks can register for those. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Any last questions? All right, good night. Good night, thank you. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.